hello there. I did not see you come in. <sighs> hey people, it's Ben. And welcome to a bit of a different video. This is something I've wanted to do for a very long time. Something where I'm just sitting, talking about something that I love. So for those of you that watch my videos, you know I love to make music, but I specifically love film music. Film music is so special to me. I eventually want to become a film composer. I love just talking about film music. So today, I wanna share my top five underrated or overlooked film scores. Movies with incredible music that shockingly no one talks about anymore and never won any awards. And I thought it appropriate to do it during award season, which is now. So let's get into this. But before I start, I just wanna say, I don't fancy myself some film connoisseur who's listened to every soundtrack and has this super developed taste. I'm just some guy that loves film scores and I wanna share my opinion. That's what it is. It's my opinion. It's my top five. It's not the top five, just my top five. The movies I'm gonna talk about are ones that I grew up with, that my friends grew up with, music that inspired the crap out of me, and that no one really talks about anymore. And although this isn't really in any particular order per se, in the good nature of list videos, we'll number them and count down, starting with number five. Spider-Man. Now I know you're probably thinking, Ben, this movie made like a crap trillion dollars at the box office. How could anything about it be underrated? And that's a good question. This movie opened up the floodgates for superhero movies. Back in 2002, people were losing their minds about finally seeing a realistic live action Spider-Man. <laughs> And so much emphasis was placed on the visual aspects of the film that Danny Elfman's brilliant score was vastly overshadowed. And that is so obvious in one of the biggest complaints I hear about this movie, that the opening credits are too long. Why are these credits so long? I don't care who the director of photography was, I wanna see Spider-Man! What those people don't understand is that this is an overture, something that's becoming very rare in movies nowadays. In this overture, Danny Elfman sets the tone for this film through the music. You basically hear the story of the movie through the music. I remember when I first heard those soft, dark violins over the Columbia logo, I was like, this movie's gonna be epic, isn't it? Right away you're introduced to Spider-Man's theme, which is so dark, it's classic Danny Elfman. <laughs> This whole overture is just electrifying. The chorus, the brass, the electronics, which by the way, Elfman has a really good ear for. I'll go for a run and listen to this song and just get pumped. What's really cool is that at the end of this overture, we're introduced to Peter Parker's theme. was such a good idea to have two distinct themes for physically the same person, but as a character, Peter Parker and Spider-Man are at odds with each other. Peter Parker's theme is very noble and majestic sounding. It's symbolic of how he is a good person deep down. Spider-Man's theme, dark, tumultuous, stormy. It's symbolic of how he doesn't really know who he wants to be. One of my favorite moments musically is when Peter Parker is sitting alone in his room just torn apart about losing Uncle Ben. You hear this like sad piano ballad. <laughs> It's really good at conveying Peter Parker's emotion. You feel his pain through the music, not sappy melodramatic dialogue. The warehouse scene. Very good choice to have no music at the beginning when the goblin is just pounding Spider-Man to the point of hopelessness. But then when the goblin says, I'm gonna kill MJ, nice and slow. And Spider-Man is pissed. The orchestra starts to rise and he's just gritting his teeth. He of course beats the goblin. I really love what happens in the orchestra after the goblin dies. It's like this dark, dreamy moment.
And at Norman Osborn's funeral, you hear those soft, dark chords on the strings that opened up the movie. We get more cool fanfare as Spider-Man is swinging around Manhattan. And then in the ending credits, we get Nickelback. Number four, Rudy, Rudy, Rudy. Jerry Goldsmith did the score for this one. It's a sports movie, which once again, I kind of feel like the score is usually underplayed in sports movies, just like with superhero movies. The best one of all time, of course, being Rocky, but I think Rudy is the most underrated one. If you haven't seen the movie, it's about this guy, Rudy. All he wants is to play on the Notre Dame football team, so there's a lot of collegiate and Irish sounding music all throughout, which is great. But what really carries this movie is Rudy's theme, which is so beautiful. I hear that theme, I kind of get a little teary-eyed, to be honest. It's just so inspiring. That, th that, that scene where he opens the letter? Forget about it. All Rudy wants is to get into Notre Dame and play on the football team. But throughout his entire life, everyone, including his family, they're just like, you're not smart enough, you're not big enough, just stay at your job at the steel mill. Rudy tries so hard to get into Notre Dame and he gets rejection after rejection. But when he opens that letter, and he finally gets accepted to Notre Dame, and you hear his theme? The tryouts song, very cool, very Irish sounding. It's got that upbeat triplet rhythm, you know, like yeah, da, 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 da. Rudy dresses for the last game. He's on field for the last few plays and he gets a sack and they carry him off the field on their shoulders and his theme comes back and it's awesome. That theme is just so hopeful sounding. It really embodies this guy, Rudy. You know, the funny thing is that this movie's based on a real guy. Like, Rudy is a real person, still alive today. So just imagine, like, he's a regular guy, but he has his own theme song because of this movie. Like, wouldn't that be cool just to have your own theme song and whenever you do something awesome, like get into your dream college, you can play that song on your phone or something? Maybe I'll start a business where I write theme songs for people. <laughs> Number three. The Village. I gotta say, I really enjoy most Shyamalan movies, including The Village, but for the most part, everyone hated this movie when it came out. It was trashed by critics, mostly because of the really obscure ending. Over the years, though, I think this movie has grown on a lot of people, especially diehard Shyamalan fans. It's very suspenseful, it's a beautifully shot movie, and it's one of the best film scores of the year, if not of the decade. I mean, for crying out loud, it was nominated for an Academy Award. But for the most part, the score is so overlooked because of how much hate this movie received when it first came out. James Newton Howard is just a master of atmospheric music. What's interesting is that this score doesn't really have that many themes, per se, that stand out. It's got little melodies here and there that will resurface. But really no actual themes that stand out. It's a very atmospheric somber score. The orchestra and the strings sound like they're straight out of the Romantic era. It really drives home that 19th century feel, which of course makes you feel even more like an idiot at the end when you find out the twist. But seriously, I cannot praise this score enough. The strings are so lush. There's this new trend in movies and TV shows nowadays that really bothers me. You see, a lot of scores nowadays are also atmospheric. 
but it just doesn't sound like a lot of care was put into the music. It basically just sounds like a guy sitting at a really expensive keyboard and really expensive software, but just playing like boring chord progression. Just to quickly slap on to a film or TV show just so it has some sort of ambience to it. But as I listen to the soundtrack for The Village, you can just tell Howard put so much care into every single note. And it makes the melodies and the motifs just sing, even though it's a very dark score. Put this soundtrack on while you're doing anything, and I guarantee it will make it a little bit more epic. So like I said, these are movies that I grew up with, and when I was young, I adored Balto. I used to pretend to be Balto. But watching this movie again as an adult, it is clearly aimed at kids. Balto is trying to transport medicine to his town in Alaska to save this girl from whooping cough or something. And of course, there's this love story between the girl's dog and Balto. There are these cute polar bears. <laughs> there's this bumbling goose named Boris, and it's all very cute. But the music to this movie? <sighs> no, seriously, it makes me feel cold. How is that possible? I mean, obviously music has the power to convey emotions like happiness, sadness, or anger. But what about temperature? What about weather? Sure, you could say that certain instruments like bells have a wintry sound to them, but what about melodies? What about chord progressions? Could hearing a melody make you feel like you have to put a sweater on? Hmm. Well, the way I think this is accomplished in Balto is through modes. I won't get too technical. Let me just show you what I'm talking about. This is the main theme for Balto. You hear how all of a sudden it sort of changes color when it changes key? Well, that's because the mode has also changed. Listen to it again. <clears throat> That minor chord right there kind of makes it have an arctic sort of chilling sound, doesn't it? And in the score, the use of chimes makes you feel the cold Alaskan wind. But it's long overdue that I talk about who did this movie, and that is the late, great James Horner. I gotta say, there's this sled dog race at the beginning of the movie. The music is so exciting. The percussion is really cool. There's a lot of reverb, which once again, I think is to make you feel like you're in Alaska in the middle of nowhere, surrounded by mountains and snow. So when Balto actually sets out on his journey to go get the medicine and bring it back to the town and save this girl, the music is so adventurous sounding. It keeps the film going. My favorite moment is at the end after Balto returns back to the town. He brings the medicine back. Hooray. And you see this weird silhouette of Balto on the mountain. It's supposed to be the Northern Lights. The music there is just really haunting. I've talked about a lot of great film scores, but there is one that I believe is the most underrated of all time, and it's by my favorite composer of all time. composed by the maestro, John Williams, who never disappoints. Just as a film, Hook is criminally underrated. I almost always agree with what I see on Rotten Tomatoes, but Hook is one of those movies where I see the tomato meter and I'm just like, 
you're you're wrong, okay? You're you're just wrong. But let's talk about the music. This movie is exploding with themes. There are so many and they're all amazingly catchy. Tinkerbell's theme, the one that I just played, it's so surreal and fairy-like, isn't it? You've got the flying theme. what's arguably Peter Pan's theme. And my favorite, the Lost Boys theme. The Lost Boys theme is pretty much just a variation on Peter Pan's theme, which makes sense because, you know, Peter's a lost boy. There are a few moments where the score will interact with the movie, like when the pirates are chanting, Hook! Hook! Give us the hook! We hear Hook's theme in tempo with their chant. Hook! 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 Give us the hook! 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 Give us the hook! It's dark, but it's also bouncy and comical, just like Dustin Hoffman as Hook. He's dark, he loves to kill people, but he's so... Funny. Another example of the score coming to life through the characters is when Maggie is singing to the stars. It introduces what's sort of like the kids theme. Da, 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 da. There's one theme that only appears once. It's only in one scene. That's it. But it's so good. It's the Never Feast. You loot crew group bag of pre chewed food, dude. This movie also really shows John Williams' versatility as a composer. That really cool jazz song at the beginning. I think my favorite moment in the film is when Peter has just met the Lost Boys and they're messing with him like, play, play, throwing the basketball at him. And none of them believe Tinkerbell that he is the pan. Even he's in denial of it. But this one courageous little boy sits him down and just starts to like look at him and mess with his face and take off his glasses and look through his glasses, trying to find Peter Pan. And you hear the Lost Boys theme and it's perfect. Oh, there you are, Peter. You know, scenes like that are becoming more and more rare nowadays. It's almost like directors don't really value just quiet moments like that. Emotions don't have sound, so the best way to get your audience to recognize the emotions that the characters are feeling is through the music. And my gosh, John Williams does such a good job with that. That about wraps it up. Those are my top five underrated or overlooked film scores, however you want to put it. I had so much fun just writing down notes for these movies and talking about them on this video. I want to do more like it. It's sort of like my way of fleshing out my thoughts for real rather than just talking to myself about it because I do do that out loud in public. I want to know what are some of your favorite film scores that you feel are underrated or overlooked i want to know leave it in the comments i will read them guys thank you so much for watching and as always keep rocking